I don't think there's ever been a more interesting time to be a NASCAR fan. Sure, the officiating sucks, the tires are 99% hot gas, and the engines explode every 10 seconds. Did somebody say boom? But if you thought 2021 was crazy, you ain't seen nothing yet. A combination of new cars, new teams, and new tracks made for a record-breaking year in terms of parity. Just think about it. In the past two years, we've seen 70% of the full-time field find victory lane. And now it's time to meet them, as well as those still searching for their slice of success. Same song, third verse. Last year might not have been the ass whooping that came before it, but make no mistake, the masterclass is still in session. Bearing the flag is Kyle Larson, coming off a championship hangover so palpable it gave everyone a headache, or at least the dozen or so drivers he slammed into. Now sure, three wins is nothing to scoff at, but after the most dominant run since Gordon in 98, needless to say, it was a little disappointing. But the end of the season had promise, and if they keep that momentum, young money may cash out once again. But don't let that overshadow his teammate, who last year was a winning machine. He was winning under green, under yellow, and in one case didn't even have to cross the line first. It was also a year with a lot of turmoil, as Elliott would end up losing a lot of the races he had in the bag, and it brought out a fire that we haven't really seen from him since 2017. It'll be fun to watch, if Chase will let us. As for Alex Bowman, it was a year to forget. The win in Vegas was nice, but everything afterward felt like a downward spiral, one that would lead him to a hasty playoff exit due to a concussion that hopefully he's left in the dust. On the flip side, William Byron had his best season yet, aside from a legal debacle where, like Liberty University, he settled out of court. Still, it was another statement year for the organization, and signs of slowing have yet to show. The same can't be said for the other powerhouse, as their worst case scenario has come to pass. Their star driver given the stanky boot, and their flagship car left to the ruins of history. Alas, many changes are being made at Joe Gibbs, and not a lot of them good. The second coming has made his long-awaited move to the Cup Series, and while his talent can't be disputed, his on-track and media etiquette is another story. It got to a point where competitors were outright bullying him in their interviews, and people absolutely loved it. He was that unlikable. There's still time to turn things around, but the clock is ticking. He's no longer at the kids' table. If he pulls even a smidgen of that shit from Martinsville, you can bet there'll be hell to pay. Mainly in the form of seasoned veterans like MTJ, who just came off his first winless season in eight years. On paper, that looks pretty bad, but in practice, there's more to it. Like years past, he had bad fast race cars, but whether it was an engine failure, a tire blowout, or a spin on pit road, he couldn't buy himself a break. But he's been through this before, and hopefully his win in the clash gave him enough piss and vinegar to get back into fighting form. Denny Hamlin seemed to take that form all year, writing checks he never had any intention of cashing. He won a few races, pushed some people around, but in the end, he lost in a way that only he could, through his biggest rival doing something that had never been done before, and will never be done again. Some may think of it as his competition finding unique ways to win, but I think of it more as Denny finding another way to lose. Tune in this year to find out how else Denny Hamlin will lose a championship. It's true, things aren't looking too good for JGR, but their lone ray of light may be the young prodigy in Christopher Bell. He may not be up to snuff with his teammates yet, but where others dwell in darkness, he shines brighter than ever before. Twice last season, he had his back against the wall, facing elimination dead in the eye, and both times he emerged victorious. He's officially become a threat, not just for wins, but for the championship. Speaking of championships, Penske Racing now has three, two of which are Joey Logano's. <sighs> I remember 2018 like it was yesterday. Three past champions who had earned their place with inhuman consistency and an avalanche of wins. And then there was him. And he won. <sighs> Can you play the Martinsville crash for me, please? Kenza takes him out! Logano into the wall! Ah, much better. Well, fast forward a few years and the tides have turned. Instead of being the youngest, he's now the oldest driver in the championship four. And it shows. While his competition was busy scrambling through their self-inflicted wounds, he enjoyed the clean air of a leisurely Sunday drive. From the start of the weekend, that championship was his, and I see no reason why that confidence won't continue to fester into 2023. Now you might think that his teammate would be happy to see him win the cup, but in his post-race interview, Ryan Blaney showed nothing but disgust. Maybe he was just jealous of his wicked new hairdo, but it more likely had to do with his first winless season since his rookie year. It's not like he didn't have his chances, as he won more stages than anyone else. But that green and white tablecloth is only good for two things, playoff points and missed opportunities. His only race win came in an exhibition, and he had to win it twice. No wonder he looks so dejected. Now kicking off your rookie year by winning the sport's biggest prize should be elating, but beware the cautionary tale of one Trevor Bain. Not all that glitters is gold. And Austin Sindrick proved that last year. A transfer to the second round of the playoffs was serviceable, but not good enough for the car he's driving. 
He should enjoy that trophy, but it's going to take some serious work if he wants to get back on top. That's not what I meant. Talk about getting back on top, how about RCR? Tyler Reddick broke through for not just his first, not just his second, but three victories in 2022. Also Austin Dillon won Daytona, but man, that eight car was on rails. And I don't know if you heard, but it has a new driver for 2023. After a decade and a half with JGR, the candy man, or uh, I mean the vapey man, has found a new home. Now working for a guy who once put him in a headlock and punched him in the face. And it still somehow feels less hostile than the environment at Joe Gibbs, who ended his tenure abruptly because they couldn't find sponsorship. For the guy with the most championships. Wilson. This put a damper on their swan song season, which wouldn't even make it past the first round. But KFB is still KFB, and he's stepping into a proven piece of machinery. Some may see it as a downgrade, but for all we know, the best of Rowdy may be yet to come. As for the other guy, check back in a few weeks. For Stuart Haas Racing, last year was a quandary. They were more competitive, but still not quite back to championship contention. On the upside, Tony's protege had a surprising sophomore season. After a rough rookie campaign, he finally got his first win and made it all the way to the round of eight, where he came dangerously close to making the final round, and if he had, he could have easily shocked the world. Yeah, for Briscoe, it was a step in the right direction. But then there's these two. There's no beating around the bush. Almarola and Custer were awful. They may have swept the polls at Bristol, but that's all they have to boast of. Eric looked like he was ready to retire, and Custer could barely stay in the top 30. Some weeks, he was struggling against the Rick Ware cars. That's embarrassing enough, but now he's been demoted to the Xfinity series, maybe for good. But who knows, maybe he'll pull a Saddler and return to form. And taking his place is an even bigger mystery. Ryan Priest said fate will tell me if I meant to do this at a bigger level. Fate has decided Ryan Priest is going to win at Iowa. Ryan Priest, a guy who's been tossed around more than a beach ball at Coachella. It originally looked like he'd have a shot with Joe Gibbs, but like most of their drivers, they'd toss him aside, pretend like he never existed, and send him a severance package that looked like this. He found himself with a mid-packer in JTG, but still wanted something more. And when an opportunity opened up to be a reserve driver for SHR, he pounced on it. Nobody wants to sit out a whole season, just ask Daniel Ricciardo. But his patience would eventually pay off, as his services are now being called upon for Car 41. It's been a while since that team's been competitive, but I have a feeling Priest could bring some much-needed change. Hell, with all the parody we've seen as of late, he might even win a race. And then there's the closer, the Bakersfield Basher. Good old Happy Harvick. A man of many names and even more wins, he's decided to hang up his helmet after 2023. And I can't think of a more perfect time to do it. After 21, people were wondering if they had seen Harvick's last win, but for two wonderful weeks, he put everyone back on notice. Even had people touting him as a championship favorite, until his hopes were smoldered because of the crappy ass parts. Still, he came close to winning the Roval and finished top five in Phoenix. And if Gordon, Stewart, and Kenseth could win in their final seasons, I have no doubt that Harvick can too. Go get him, Harv. Now this was a fun team to watch. In the blink of an eye, they went from field filler to championship contender. And Daniel Suarez finally broke through, winning his first race, making the second round of the playoffs, and showing winning speed on any given week. Sure, he wasn't the most consistent, but at least he's finally found a team he can thrive in, and hopefully it'll lead to more success moving forward. Still, he pales in comparison to his teammate, who was no doubt the biggest surprise of 2022. You could almost call last year the year of the melon, because even when he wasn't winning, he made just about every headline. Starting rivalries, breaking rules, you name it, he did it. After not even making the playoffs in the year before, he wasn't just in, but seated in third place. And after blowing through the first two rounds, it looked like he could take it all the way to Phoenix. But sports have a funny way of bringing people back down to earth. This isn't just some fairy tale where the underdog prevails and beats the odds. Let's do this, Leroy Jenkins! Say what you will, but this guy was easily the most memorable part of 22. And I can't wait to see what he'll do next. Another 2021 upstart who had a solid year was 2311. It may not have been quite as flashy, but it was rife with substance, as both of their drivers would find victory lane in their first multi-win season. Bubba Wallace has emerged as a possibility for the playoffs, showing more and more speed on the big tracks. Unfortunately, he has a temper. There's no getting around that. But as long as he can keep it cool, I have no doubt we'll be seeing him in victory lane again. Now is when I should mention that this team had to go through hell last year. After Kurt Busch's career was needlessly cut short by NASCAR's engineers lacking a fundamental understanding of physics, the season turned into a fuster cluck. At one point, the team had to field both cars with relief drivers. At least now they have imprints of everyone's butts, but still, they needed to find a permanent replacement. 
The original plan was to have Tyler Reddick join the team in 2024, but after all the sudden changes and an awkward Twitter post from RCR, he decided to join the team a year early. For most drivers, adjusting to a new team, new sponsors, and a new manufacturer would take some time, but Tyler is a special case. He just spent three years taking a struggling RCR and bringing it back to winning form, and quietly had one of the best seasons of anyone last year. If there's a car to look out for, it's this one. They also have a nice addition in Travis Pastrana for the 500, and it'll be fun to see how he adjusts, both to the car and to the paint scheme. Ugh. The way I see it, as long as both drivers stay happy and healthy, we could be seeing the origins of a truly great race team. The same could be said for Petty GMS. I'm sorry, I mean, <clears throat> Legacy Motor Club. Eric Jones firing from the 20 may have been a blessing in disguise, as he took his number 43 bowl by the horns, bringing it back to victory lane for the first time in eight years. He's shown that this team has potential, and as long as they keep delivering him good cars, they might just find themselves in the playoffs. This is where I thought the segment would end, but believe it or not, they did have a second car. Ty Dillon, after wreaking havoc in the clash, finished the season over 300 points behind his teammate. He's never really had a shot in good equipment, but at this point, I'm not sure he deserves one. In retrospect, this was probably his best shot at finding victory, and he didn't even come close. He'll be sent to Spire to languish for a few more years, and taking his place is Noah Gragson, a new candidate for the Most Popular Driver Award coming off an eight-win season in the Xfinity series. And with him comes a test of both driver and team. They need to get both cars on the same level. And although he won't come storming right out of the gate, I believe Gragson could be the missing piece they've been looking for. All right, now the segment's definitely, oh, wait, what the hell? What happened to retirements becoming permanent? Don't get me wrong, I'm excited to see him back, but I don't think it's gonna go how everyone thinks. Just look at Terry Labonte and Bill Elliott, generational talents who came back only to take a perennial role in last place. Hopefully he breaks the cycle, but I wouldn't get my hopes up. That being said, this paint scheme is awesome and I can't wait to see it on track. Now we arrive at the last team to win in 2022, and while the season as a whole wasn't all that great, at least they did something. One of the biggest enigmas of the past decade has been the decline of Roush Fenway, a once dominant team among the likes of Hendrick and Gibbs finding themselves trampled by single car teams like Furniture Row and the Wood Brothers. Turns out there was a fundamental culture problem. As the world changed around them, they stayed the same, and as other teams figured out the Gen 6, Roush was stuck in the mud. Something had to change, and for the longest time, nothing did. That is until Brad Keselowski came in and did a total reset. New people, new equipment, new name, and right off the bat, it paid dividends with a shutout in the Daytona duels. The team struggled a lot from there, but resets take time, and it's already paid off with a win in Bristol and a few other runs that were just as competitive. Both drivers have turned a lot of heads, and I'm intrigued to see where this goes. Truth be told, I think all the teams that deserved to win last year did. All except one. After a surprise win at Indy, Colleg Racing was poised to make a big splash in their move to the Cup Series, and they almost did. AJ Allmendinger was as formidable as ever on the road courses, and Justin Haley dominated the big tracks. But still, time and time again, try as they might, they could not find victory lane. But this is a new year, one where Haley will be returning to the 31, Allmendinger will be running his first full-time season since his JTG days, and a multitude of other drivers will be running a third entry, starting with the Truck Series hotshot, Chandler Smith. This team has been on a turbulent climb, and this seems to be their all-in year. Let's just hope it pays off. Ah yes, NASCAR's mid-pack muse. Is this team ever gonna find their footing? They had flashes of brilliance from Michael McDowell, but wins for them still come less often than holidays. There's still something missing, and Todd Gillen's humdrum of a rookie year didn't make things much better. As punishment, he'll now be forced to split the ride with Zane Smith. I'd say that there's hope, but more and more teams are gonna be figuring out this new car. Time is running out. Tick tock. That clock seems to have already run out for JTG. The poll in Daytona was great, but that was three years ago. Since then, they've totaled 26 cars and have only managed to be competitive on the big tracks. Let me spell it out for you. You're not winning with this team, and you're certainly not winning with this driver. Now watch them pull a super speedway win out of their ass. This team's downfall has been depressing. Everything since Ryan Blaney seems to have been a mistake. They had a few good moments with Menard and Benedetto, but now they're back in the muck. Rock bottom. Advanced darkness. I hope Harrison can turn things around, but it's going to take time. I wouldn't get my hopes up for this season. With the number font of Furniture Row and the old shop of Alan Kolwicki, this team truly is the underdog. Honestly, I don't care if they aren't competitive, I just want to see them win. Especially with Corey LaJoy. And they came so close last year, but here's the thing. Even at super speedways, where seemingly anyone can win, you'll see a car out front that clearly doesn't belong. 
The driver may be in his prime and clearly wants it more than anyone, but the engine is heaving, the tires are screaming, and pushes from behind feel like they're coming from a snowplow. This was how it felt watching the finish at Atlanta, and I'm of the opinion that if Spire wants to win, they need to help their driver. Corey LaJoy is one of the most underrated talents in stock car racing, and if they want him to realize his potential, they'll need to go the way of RFK. Change with the times. Big things could be in store, but that remains to be seen. There's a few more smaller teams to go over, but I don't see them going anywhere except for the garage. Good as it was to see Greg Biffle back in cup with NY Racing, I doubt we'll be seeing them or DeBiff again this year. Same could be said for MBM Motorsports and Team Hezeberg, who have yet to announce any plans for 2023. Then there's Rick Ware, who continues to follow the mantra of quantity over quality, keeping it in the family and roping in that monster money. They did have some solid showings from Joey Hand, though I think that has more to do with the driver than the team. Speaking of teams, the money team is back for another bout in the great ring of racing, with IndyCar's Connor Daly taking a dip in the turbulent turns of Daytona. It's good to see so many open-wheel drivers trying their hand in stock cars, and I hope it brings more interest to the sport. That being said, their only concern is making the race. They had a hard enough time with that last year. And last, and probably least as well, is Live Fast. Compared to the other teams from 21, these guys have been incredibly disappointing, which there's really no excuse for. We're entering a renaissance for smaller teams, but these guys haven't gotten the memo. And if they can't get it together, they could be left in the dust. I'd love to see the 78 and the eternally underrated Matt Tift in victory lane, but at this rate, we may have to wait a decade or two. Don't hold your breath. And there you have it, the entire NASCAR field in a nutshell. After the roller coaster that was last year, it's pretty much impossible to pick a champion, so for now, I'll settle for the playoffs. Firstly, I think Cliff Daniels and Kyle Larson will finally figure out the next gen. Then Joey and his unadulterated swagger will put him in handedly. Next comes Chase Elliott, and call me crazy, but I think Ty the Reddick will be right there with him. Then comes the Boss Man, the Bow Man, and the Melon Man. And after last year, you just have to include Bell and Byron. I think the stage points alone will be enough to put Blaney and Truex in, but now's where things get a little bit weird. He may be known as the road course dinger, but he's shown just as much speed on the ovals, and in my opinion will almost certainly give Collig Racing their first playoff appearance in the Cup Series. Next up is Daniel Suarez, who despite being a little shaky at times is still more than capable of getting back to the playoffs. And then there's Bubba Wallace. I don't see him going far, but he's had way too much speed at the big tracks to not pick up at least one win in the regular season. And then comes a master in consistency, Kevin Harvick who might not be getting back to victory lane, but will almost certainly make one last playoff appearance. And last is Ty Gibbs. I'll be frank, I can't stand this guy. He's an affront to the working man sport of auto racing, is totally checked out from the social zeitgeist, and represents the squeaky clean persona that's been sucking all personality from the sport for the better part of a decade. But when he gets behind the wheel, none of that matters. He's still one of the greatest rising talents in auto racing, and nothing can take that away. After his explosive debut in the Xfinity series, I'm not above saying he could win the 500, or at least one race before the playoffs. You may be noticing a pretty big exclusion. Yes, Kyle Busch is one of the greatest drivers of all time, but he hasn't been with a new team in 15 years. I think it'll take some time to adjust, and I believe the same to be true for Ryan Priest and Noah Gragson. As for Austin Sindrick and Chase Briscoe, I hope they prove me wrong, but neither have shown the consistency needed to contend for a championship. And if they're not going to make it, Almarola, Burton, and Stenhouse certainly won't. Other noteworthy exclusions include Busher, Keselowski, Jones, Haley, and Austin Dillon. <laughs> uh, just kidding. And that, my friends, are my predictions for the 2023 NASCAR playoffs. Now watch as they age like milk. 42 car has been involved in everything in this race <laughs> at some point. If, if you were the insurance adjuster on this play, you'd be filling out <laughs> forms on four cars, I think. He's getting canceled Monday. Yeah. <laughs>